All right, welcome to another episode of Let to Be Talk. Here we are on a Monday, uh, July 29th, and I'm finally out of the casino prison. 15 days of casino run, and I am done. Whew. Holy shit. Shows were fantastic, but to uh, stay in a casino for 15 days, I think truly could be an experiment on uh, the human body of what happens. Uh, you know, you're just breathing in that fake air and cigarette smoke and, and insane noises of ching, 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 bong, 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 oh, it's crazy. Eating food that has who knows what in it to keep it, uh, keep it fresh. Pumped up with some kind of shit. Bringing on the depression and the gloom. But I battled through it. I powered through it. The shows were incredible. All the shows were great. It's, uh, it's, an ama it's been an amazing run. What was it? 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 23 gigs. 23 gigs straight, something like that, in a casino, two casinos, actually. The uh, Connecticut one, Mohican Sun, and then out at the Rio Hotel for the Comedy Cellar. So there it is, out there earning, earning my fucking stripes to be a comedy soldier. Good to be home, good to be here in L.A., going to be here for a few days, and then I'm off to New York City for a month and uh, that'll be great to go there and work the comedy cellar and the newsstand and and see my boy Marcus Price and some other friends looking forward to that not looking forward to that fucking humidity the weather's been crazy Vegas was insane it was 106 7 degrees each day and there's some kind of fucking crazy uh, what do they call those grasshoppers it was like a grasshopper invasion, full blown. It's just, uh, I don't know what the hell, just satanic for sure. Just grasshoppers everywhere, millions and millions of grasshoppers. I've never seen anything like it. Oh, my God. But uh, just, just another uh, entry into my brain diary for some kind of bit maybe down the road that'll pop up on stage. Uh, who knows? Anyway, welcome aboard today. We've got a great guest, the return of Tom Rothrock today. Famous producer. He uh, discovered Beck. He, he did all the early Beck records, worked with Foo Fighters, James Blunt, The Killers, you name it. This man has made some incredible records. And if you haven't heard the first episode that I did with him about two and a half years ago, go back and listen to that one first and then come back and listen to this one because uh, the first episode does definitely cover a lot of his career, and it was when I first met him. This episode uh, is very, very cool, because I consider Tom uh, a great friend, and he's definitely got some uh, spiritual vibe to him that between the two of us, there's a, a great chemistry in the uh, artistic world. Uh, we sit down and we talk about a, a comedy record that we made together a couple years ago that never came out, and we finally talk about why it didn't come out and what's in the future for the two of us. And we also uh, talk about what's in the future for Tom and Bong Load Records and everything going on. He's working with a new band right now called Hollywood Hex that uh, he has given me two tracks and you'll hear uh, one at the end of it. Actually, I'll put both tracks at the end, but you did hear a little bit of the uh, band at the uh, beginning of this intro right here. That's who that was, Hollywood Hex. Brand new band he's working with. His first, uh, I would say, signing in many years on Bong Load Records, which is pretty damn exciting. Band sounds great. And it was very cool of Tom to stop by and give a couple songs to you, Dale Razors. He's also uh, hooking up all Dell Razors that listen to this episode. If you go to bongloadrecords.com, he's giving you a super deal on the Masters of Reality masterpiece on vinyl, deep in the hole. One of my favorite releases from Masters of Reality. 
He's uh, going to hook you guys up with a deal on Deep in the Hole, which will definitely be a collector's item once it's sold out. A lot of these bong load reissues go for big money now on eBay. So don't sleep on this. All Dale Razors are going to get a discount on Deep in the Hole. And if you buy Deep in the Hole, he's going to send you a free 7-inch of the new Hollywood Hex. So that is pretty damn cool. Thank you, Tom, for doing that. And thank you for doing the show. Uh, it's just fantastic to, to sit down and talk to this man. He is definitely a, uh, an interesting, fantastic human. Uh, let's see here. I got some shows coming up I want to tell you about. I will be in New York City starting on August 3rd through the 18th. And you can catch me at the Comedy Cellar and the brand new stand location. Looking forward to that. I will also be out on the road with Mark Marin in Texas in August. Uh, Austin, Dallas, and Houston. Those are going to be great. I'm headlining Cleveland Hilarities September 20th and 21st. Finally going to Cleveland. Nashville, the one-nighter at High Watt Rock Club October 5th. And this is a brand new gig in December 28th, San Francisco, with Joey Diaz, we're doing the Palace of Fine Arts. This is going to be smoking. So looking forward to seeing all you guys out there. And uh, you can see all the tour dates on DeanDelRay.com. Go there and get your tickets. Do not miss out on this stuff. Don't, you know, it's easy click. DeanDelRay.com, boom, there you are on the website. Hit touring and all the ticket links are there. Speaking of tickets, I always have cool stuff for Dell Razors, always. And there's a brand new app out today. And I want you guys to get this because this is pretty badass. You want to get some last minute tickets, super easy to use. Get this app, Today Ticks. Don't sleep on it. Todayticks.com slash Delray to get $10 off your first purchase. Today Ticks, that's T-O-D-A-Y-T-I-X dot com slash Delray. Get $10 off your first purchase. This is an amazing new website and app. It's this easy. Check it out. With Today Ticks app, getting tickets, tickets is fast, easy, and you can do it on your own phone. Avoid visiting box offices in person and waiting in line. It does all the hard work for you. It's so convenient that Forbes magazine calls it Today Ticks, the Uber of Broadway tickets. But it's not just Broadway tickets. It's in 16 cities now, which is really amazing. It's also in London's West Side, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., L.A., Sydney. Oh, yeah, it's going to be all over eventually. So get on board right now. Download it once and use it whenever. Check it out. It's this easy. Say you're looking for some Broadway tickets and you're in New York. I'm going to be in New York. I want to go to some Broadway plays. Boom. I fire up the app and I get some last minute tickets right there. It's that easy. Today Tix is an online ticketing platform, an app where you can get last minute theater tickets at the best prices. What began in New York City as a revolutionary way to get Broadway tickets has now expanded to 16 cities across three continents with more than 5 million users. With exclusive lottery and rush programs and an easy-to-use interface, Today Ticks is making it convenient and accessible for users to get tickets to a variety of events in your city or other cities. Your code is Delray. Remember that, people. Go to... Todayticks.com slash Delray and get $10 off your first purchase. So this is just a, a smoking way to get tickets because whenever you're in, a lot of people want to get tickets to New York Broadway plays and they're like, I don't even know how to get them, which is true. They're like, I, I win, it was sold out. Get on this website, Today Ticks. Don't sleep on this. Delray is your code. Pretty damn cool. Always got cool stuff for you guys out there. That makes sense, you know? We're not out there advertising bullshit. We got good stuff for you guys. And make sure you use it because it helps the uh, podcast. It's that easy and it helps you guys. I, I, I never understood when I offer free stuff or good deals and people are like, yeah, I didn't use it. You're like, what, what are you talking about? It's hilarious. It's so easy. 
you know. Anyway, uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you enjoy this episode. It was nice to talk to Tom about what's going on. And don't forget, at the end of the episode, there will be a couple great songs for you to hear by Hollywood Hex. And I hope you guys all enjoy it. Don't forget to leave a review on iTunes and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and the YouTube channel. And don't forget the Patreon channel. That has all the bonus episodes. We're up to number 43 now. And the newest one has me talking all about the uh, brand new Quentin Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that I absolutely worshipped. So you can hear all about that on the patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Let's get into some rock and roll right here, some comedy and some life talk with Mr. Tom Rothrock. Yeah, so uh, I went and uh, saw the Tarantino film last night. You, you got to see that. And uh, good theater? You saw it in Vegas? I saw it right here at the Palms. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What a great movie theater. i never been to it. My daughter goes. Oh, it's, to it's it. great. It's like across the street. Here's the funny thing. There was like, uh, I don't know, I went on 11 night. There was no one working. I just walked in and sat down. <laughs> there was like, they got a guy working the snack bar and the tickets. One guy. I just rolled right through, went to the theater, no one around, and watched it. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Palms, <laughs> Vegas. That place is nice over there. It's funny, you, uh, you, you took me to uh, that incredible Indian restaurant. Yeah, yeah. I've been Good having work. some great food while I'm in Vegas and going to different stuff since I'm not a gambler, drinker, smoker, partier kind of a useless town for you yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting thing to see how the locals live yeah i came here first uh around 95 96 to find a band as the scene here was just beginning you know what ultimately would turn into killers and whatnot there was those those guys were all around here and uh and the first night out i went to some classic places that are still here like the pepper mill band took me all around showgirls right next right down the street from it and uh uh it was really something to see it, like you've done now, seen it through locals. Yeah, that's wild, right? Yeah. H how long have you been here? Uh, we've had a place here for three and a half years. Three and a half years? Yeah, yeah, and I moved my label here three and a half years ago. That's about as long as I've known you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, same time, yep. <laughs> yeah, isn't that wild? Yep. I first had you on when I was living over there in Sherman Oaks, and, uh, and now here we are uh, doing a part two. Of the podcast. It seems like it was last month, man. <laughs> it really does, dude. Because I've seen you a few times since then. You've come to a couple shows at the cellar here at uh, Rio. Yep. And then I saw you one time at the Comedy Store. You came out there and then... Uh, oh, yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. And then we had, uh, we had some fun out there in Denver. Mm, yeah. That was nutty. a great week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because... That was an interesting time for me because we, we recorded this record. Yep. Everybody wanted to know where it is, what happened. And uh, it, it was weird because I think it was the first time that I really sat down and listened to the hour. And, and yeah. it was killing the whole time. And I sat down and thought, is this the first record I want to put out? Is this what I want to uh, be represented as, you know, because uh, yeah. I had talked to Attell, David Attell, and he hadn't put out a record for the first, I guess, 15 years he was doing comedy. <laughs> and I did see a lot of people that rushed stuff out, and it didn't really change their career or anything, and then later they're like, ah, I wasn't really ready for that one, you know, I just put it out there to get my name out there, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just keep digging in the trenches. You know, so it, it, that's an interesting time for me to look at because we had such a great time and the chemistry was so magic and electric. But then it really um, it really uh, made me think for a while. Yeah, it's funny that it, it's it, recording brings that intensity, doesn't it? All of a sudden, I mean, you thought about it like, oh, sure, why not? And then but then when it actually comes to be. And you're looking at it back, you, all those thoughts that would never happen otherwise happen. And uh, it's an interesting time because, you know, 
I mean, you're talking about people that, you know, would have put out music, I mean, put out a comedy record a long time ago. And then, so there's that aspect that you just described, like your thought process and talking to your friends and your peers. But then there's also the right now concept, or not concept, but the right now aspect of, is a long playing record even relevant? Yeah. Is it better to do sound bites? Is it better to do clips? Uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's an interesting time. I mean, I think about that with music as well. Uh, so as you were having those thought processes specific to your career and the statement you were going to make with a comedy record, I'm thinking about it constantly in music. Yeah, we were just talking about it. And, and as much as I... Um, the, it's a double-edged sword because I truly believe that Instagram, in a way, is ruining comedy. Mm. In 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 a way of, it gets you out there, and these people are loving these clips. Yeah, but it trains them in the wrong way at a live show. There, it's almost like these mm. little bumps of cocaine that are one minute clips. Boom, 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 and you're showing. Okay, here's my like best one minute bam, and then when the people go, they're not used to setups. And, uh, you know, uh, the pace, the pace. So they're like, Where, where's the boom, boom, boom. I get in my office while I'm bored at my job. Wow. You know, and we're in Vegas too. So it's extra relevant as you could be in Hollywood or any big city, uh, in the States and a lot, and a lot of other places in the world. Same thing happens with entertainment. DJs are playing like a quarter of a song hitting the chorus and everybody's woohoo. And they change it to another song. It's like, woohoo, woohoo. And it's just really a lame way to spend a night. And uh, yeah, so it's interesting how that stuff trains. I was selling my house in Hollywood a few years ago, speaking to DJs and electronic music, sold it to Steve Angelo from Swedish House Mafia, who subsequently sold it to Calvin Harris. And it's currently available. So if somebody wants a really music up house, Google that one up, Wonder View. But it's, uh, it's a trip how that goes and how it changes. And when I was selling that house, all of a sudden, people were acting really weird when they're coming to see it. All of a sudden, people would walk around going, "Oh yeah, I see they, you know, didn't really think about something here." Of course, we thought about everything. We spent seven years restoring this thing, and it was a Hollywood classic. It was epic. It got reviewed in something as one of the top ten remodels ever in the state of California, and uh, and somebody's blog. And uh, so we nailed it. But yet, people coming and kicking the tires that couldn't even buy it, and they were having all this critique. And I finally said to my agent, "Like, wait, what's going on?" I, I'm not asking people to review the house. I don't, I don't need feedback. I know what I did. It's, it's, it's the bomb. I said, is there any chance that this has to do with these TV shows now where everybody's going on, like, showing a bunch of houses and they're, like, critiquing it and, and being whiny? And then he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, my realtor, uh, Jeff Yarbo, amazing dude. He was, like, he's one of the only living bartenders from Studio 54. He's there from opening day to closing day. And uh, so he knows he knows culture he knows counterculture and he knows real estate and uh and he knows the media and television and uh, uh he's like yeah totally it's these tv shows people are watching tv shows and they're starting to emulate them in real estate purchases so it's the same thing like what you're talking about the training with instagram it it we all get influenced and groomed by this stuff it's uh yeah I'm, i don't even you know that's you you you, you opened up a big can of worms for me because it's like where does it start? Where does it stop? And, uh, and where do we get in? Where do we get out? Where do we get on? Where do we get off? Where, where do we use it uh, as a tool? And where do we say, screw it. We're going to go right over the top of it, and this is how it's going to be. And we create our own currents and ultimately our own trends and our own training. Uh, and that's, that's kind of been the story of my life, uh, uh, looking at what's going on in entertainment and either uh, conforming-ish you know, my idea of conforming, which it, I instantly never really worked, or just doing it and, you know, blazing one's own trail, and then people catch up. But it's a trip. It's a trip that you're, you know, but at the same time, that you bump into that stuff, and it's very real. Like, yeah, and it changes fast, and it changes now faster than ever, of course. It really does. I mean, uh, like yesterday, you and I had lunch, and uh, we shot a lot of footage while we recorded the record, and I thought, well, okay, let's just put out some of the crowd work bumps and put some... Uh, some subtitles on it like everybody's doing it and, and right. get out there. Um, and, and I do want to do that. But at, at, at the point, you know, I'm a different style of comedian than these just bam, 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 bam. So I don't want to train somebody on to um, that type of uh, rhythm and that cadence, exactly. you know. And, and, and the weirdest thing was, you know, everybody asked where the record was, and I was so excited. It was like a bong load release. Yeah. This is incredible. They've never done a comedy record. I think Killer it was the artwork th we got for it. Yeah, oh, the artwork's beautiful. And I was thinking the 30-year anniversary or whatever it was at the time. And um, 
and and, the, and mostly I really felt the chemistry between you and I more than anything. So then it was a it was a real drag for me because it felt like so, I was letting you down, and it was like such a bummer mm. of like God. I mean, this guy jumped in and and was we had a vibe and we really went for it. And but then at the end of the day, you know, I still look back to my. A uh, few music records that I've made, and and one of them on iTunes now, that I have no cringeworthy moments over, because I really built that thing from the ground up and made sure before I went in, and that's how I kind of I want to do a comedy record because I see people put comedy records out and it's one in a million it changes their career one okay. in a million. And the rest, they have comedy records out, and you make some money from Sirius XM playing your uh, clips and stuff, which would be really nice. So when I go see one of your sets, and there's multiple people in the night, do most of them have an album at this point, or or half and half? Or? Uh, half and half. When you, you get know? to the headliners, when you get yeah. to like you're, you know, you and the guys right around you, like obviously the yeah. opener's probably just getting going and doesn't. But when the season, people, all the guys, if you come to the store, they got yeah. specials or records out. Right. But I. It, I just felt also it was like in this world, like I was talking to uh, somebody and they said, what do you really want to do in comedy? And I go, well, to tell you the truth, I would probably do a Netflix 15 minutes mm. because I think that's all about the people have um, patience for right. on somebody that's not well known. That makes total sense. Absolutely. They'll sit down and give you 15 minutes, but they're still going to look at their phone a few times while they're watching it. But to put an hour out, it, it's, it's hard to write great material that you love and then just give it away uh, in, a, in a sense of just putting it out there and then it's material burned. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to go a year later doing the stuff in the record and people are like, dude, this is on your record. And I don't like to do that. I even feel weird once in a while if I whip out the stuff I did on Conan uh, you right. know, six months ago. So it's a, it's a real, to me, it's, as cheesy as this sounds, it's a complete art form to me. And also, I know that if we just threw that out, we weren't going to just throw it up. But if we just put it out, it might have not changed the world. And then I was like, I don't know if that, I wanted that to represent me coming out of the gate. Yeah. What was the last comedy record you can think of that changed somebody's uh, trajectory? Well, specials wise, which uh, turned yes, that's that's a new that's a newer thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were uh, newer from the Mar conversation and uh, after the last podcast, we were right. talking about the classic records and going back there. And that's I think when comedy records made a difference. I mean, the last one I'm thinking of is, is uh, no, well, no, it was, it was. I mean, by the time it was Kennison, it was specials, right? Like an HBO special back then, right? And those are, those are, if you look at stuff that has really changed the game in, in comedy, there's two things. There's the podcast. Yeah. And if you look at this, it's coming up on eight years, and I've talked about it, where I didn't want to interview comics and stuff when I started because Marin was doing that. But mm -hmm. then it also, I created this giant monster uh, music podcast but those people didn't necessarily, it didn't drive butts into the seats because they, uh, they love the podcast, but they maybe weren't a comedy fan or, they're, or yeah. they just don't, you know, they got kids, they don't go out. Where, where comedy podcast created rabid comedy fans and they'd be out and, and there, you know? So that was a, a, a thing that was weird for me. I thought that, oh, well, look at all these listeners. They're going to be in the rooms. Yep. Uh, but anyway, podcasting changed the game for comics. And then there was a few specials that really lit fire, and they were, um, over the last, I'd say, five years, that really spoke to people. One would be uh, Sebastian Maliscalco, and I think that really spoke to some, uh, kind of his generation. He's, I think he's in his 40s. I'm in my 50s. Uh, and the people came out. Uh, Ali Wong. Uh, people saw that one. She did one pregnant. That changed the game for her. And I would say, uh, who else really? Uh, and then, of course, Burr over the years. But his uh, stuff was, you know, 25 years, slowly picking off fans, um, you know, one at a time. But now he looks like, uh, 
you know, like uh, not an overnight success, but in the last five years, he's just a monster, you know, arenas and everything. Yeah. So those are the ones you can really, uh, you can, and then, uh, and then a few others, you know, but, and then they put them out on vinyl or, or uh, audio. Right. And then that's just another uh, way to hear it. Bonus. Yeah. But those are the ones, you know, you, everybody knows that people are up there and you go, oh, wow. These guys, you know, I, I know those people since I started. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. You got you to gotta look at it as it's always just do what you love to do. And maybe one day it sticks. Mm. You know? Totally. It's like music. Um, yeah. It, the, and, and with comedy, you're not sitting around looking for a hit joke. This is a hit joke. Yeah. You know, or like a hit song. Exactly. But you're definitely looking for some kind of unique angle because well, we're there, all mining in the same stuff. There is that thing, though, where you're looking. I mean, you can't look to do it in essence. You, like you say, you have to do what you love and do what you feel, do what's true to you. But at the same time, we're all looking in comedy and music for that thing that it's just in the right moment. It drops in the slot and it has its like societal context and it just like boof it just hits the nerve at the right moment it's all you know just perfect bit of timing and uh uh that somehow takes an aspect of everyday life and represents it to people in a way that they hadn't thought of and so they love it if it's a piece of music they love it uh if it's a piece of comedy it cracks them up and and uh that's kind of the gig and I, that's what i love about it is the uh it uh that's why it never gets stale because that it is part of the continuum yeah that's true and, and also that that uh, that old thing of watch out what you get famous for. You know? <laughs> so if I listen to the material and then it, it say it hit, I like the material that we recorded. Yep. But it was also a, a, a culmination of really my first six years. Right. And I don't think you necessarily really at all the times need to put out your first six years because you're still trying to figure out. I'm still trying to figure out who I am right now. I'm just doing comedy every day. Like right now, I'm trying to, uh, I'm slowing the jokes down a little bit, seeing what that's like um, as far as different cadence and uh, mannerisms and everything. Just really exploring all the because uh, you get locked into one thing when you first start when it works whatever works right yeah you're yeah, like this is working i'm getting laughs and and then as years go by and in the last few weeks i sat down and thought like well who way am i up there and i read something amazing that uh jimmy page said i was reading this book right here it was about steve gorman put out from the black crows and jimmy page said something in there where he said if you don't get nervous before you go on stage, mm. it's because you're not trying anything new. And I was like, wow, that hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. Wow. Because yeah. I was like, that's that, it right there. Right there, man. You're not taking any chances. Yep. And, and, and that really hit me while I was out here in Vegas. I go, I'm going to try different stuff for this next six months. Jack White says a cool piece in that movie, speaking of Jimmy Page, where, you know, it's him and uh, uh, Edge and whatnot, uh, three guitar guys, and uh, in that documentary. And it may get loud. Exactly. Amazing. And, uh, yeah, I saw it in the theaters for like a week it came out, and I haven't seen it since. But that moment where Mr. White's talking about just having things slightly askew on stage. So I've just got to reach a little further or go a little, you know, whatever it is to keep him a little bit off kilter so that he's going for it, so he doesn't get complacent, he does not phoning it in, he's not like that, finding the edge, whatever it, devices, different devices that he would use to make sure that there is an edge and that he's not repeating himself, and then he's, he has to do, even if it's the simplest thing, if the, even if the amp's moved over a couple feet and he has to walk over to plug it in a couple more steps, just anything to keep it from uh, being entertained. Really, really smart, uh, very similar to what uh, Paige was saying, too. Yeah, yeah. When you were listening to the uh, comedy uh, record that we did, which is uh, fun to talk to you about, was you never done a comedy record. Yeah. And we were out there, we recorded it, it sounded great. Um, what was your uh, frame of mind as a producer? Were you just listening to it in a, in, a, in a thought of like, well, he's killing, laughs all the way through, this is great? 
or because what I was looking at was it felt like it was just killing the whole time. There was no peaks and valleys or dynamics. The audiences were really hot. And it was just yeah. like, ah. and, and you were hot too. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, you were keeping it, you were keeping it pinned, like having the amp wide open, and it was cool. It was a cool energy. Uh, but then, and in the room, it was, you know, it was like having a couple of espressos and just riding the rail. Uh, it went right through, boom, and it was over before you knew it. It was magic. But yeah, when you take away the energy of the room, and now you're left with the recording, is it going to wear people out to listen to it? Or is it going to eventually get to be too much? Uh, and so, yeah, and so, you know, you recorded those couple sets in San Diego where you were aware of that, Yep. and you made them more dynamic. And what I thought when you first brought up that thing, I'm not sure if it's just two on ten all the time, uh, and uh, I thought, you know, so many times artists will say, I can do it better when you got some magic because we got magic in Colorado. We did. And, uh, uh, and so many times, you know, people will take a second look at something and go, I, I can beat this. And it's so rare that they do. And then you went to, uh, and did some in San Diego and you did, you were managed to achieve, which is what impressed me uh, about working together was that you managed to achieve what you were going after. You're like, you know what? I don't have to be shouting all the time and I don't have to keep the audience revved up all the time by shouting and you you managed to create uh, a beautiful dynamic to it so those those later shows that we did or that you that you uh you did after the ones we did in colorado uh you know we had we've got all the pieces of a really amazing record and, and i was looking at the whole thing the whole time as uh and why those later shows were important for the dynamic and the depth that you were looking for uh that matched right where i was coming from because i was looking at the thing as a timeless classic piece uh, of of when records were king, that p weird period. Nobody expected it. I met the guy, and I won't remember his name because I was a kid. I was a janitor at the record plant, and I met the dude that made those comedy records in the beginning. And he got pigeonholed. Talk about what, be careful what you get famous for. Right. There was a dude who was like a guy around Hollywood music producer, and for Warner's, he made some comedy record that blew the. F I don't even know what record he made first, uh, and uh, but like a Carlin record probably. Yeah, exactly. That era, right. the, the golden age. He made a comedy record for Warner's, and uh, and it blew up. His name, his first name was John. Wonderful guy, and he would come around the record plant sometimes, doing like voiceover stuff, and producing, you know, like voice stuff, because he was totally pigeonholed. And uh, he was a music guy, but he'd done this comedy record, and it blew up. And the labels never thought that that would even be a, a, a you know, a product. It was not. There's no music in it, and uh, so suddenly. They were, he had a whole career for a window, for that window of time in the 70s. He was the dude that made those records. And uh, uh, it was really cool. It was an accident. Nobody ever expected it to, to go down like that. Live, specifically live comedy records. There were Cheech and Chong ones, maybe the same time or just before, but there were studio records, which was another trip. I remember when I was a kid the first time hearing uh, Up in Smoke, and I was like, what? What is this? Unbelievable. Or, you know, Up in Smoke's the movie, huh? Is that, uh, or yeah. is it the record as Up well? Up in Smoke, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, Big Bamboo or whatever that one was called, the yellow covered one with the the rolling oh, paper. Oh yeah, 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 that was brilliant. I did never had that one. I just see it in the record yeah. shop. But we also had uh, Black Beauty with die cut one. That was beautiful oh. with the shape of the pill and full. Yeah, and half. I love that one though. The up and smoke one with the uh, where you slid it out and it had the weed hidden inside the <laughs> the door panels and they were dressed as uh, women. They were yeah. smuggling. Yes, yeah, so mule and weed. So good. Yeah, obviously. I mean, we got we got two records in the can. Yeah, I remember somebody asked me. They go, "Well, so you recorded the first record, yeah?" And I go, "Yeah, it was great. Killed all the way through. The audience was amazing. It sounded incredible. Tom Rothrock, bong load. Uh, then I shelved it. And I go, "Wait, then then you did another one? I go, yeah, I did that one too, at the Comedy Store in La Jolla. That one was great. More what I was going for, but uh, shelved it. And they're like, "Wow, that's ballsy. <laughs> shelved two records." I go. Yeah, later on, maybe when I'm famous, I'll put them out. They'll be like the demos. This is the demos of my career. Not of the jokes, but of, of my career. The working steps of getting somewhere. Or maybe I never get anywhere. <laughs> Just one day put them out on YouTube and no one cares. Four, <laughs> four thumbs down. Good thing. Yeah, you should have never put these out. <laughs> Who knows? But it's, it's, a, it's a wild world. I think the best thing about it, though, was being able to hang with you and work with you, um, a, a dream record producer in Colorado, staying in this loft, going over the notes, really digging in. We're eating healthy. Yeah, we're out yeah. there. We're getting our heads together. We're running around Red Rocks. We're filming shit. And I'll never forget that. 
ever. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it was it was really special to me. And no matter what happened, uh, I'm out here in Vegas, and I wanted to hook up hook up with you again, just to shoot the shit. I think you're one of the best guests I've ever had on here. One of the most Whoa. interesting guys. Uh, you're working on James Blunt right now. Yep. Mixing a record. Yeah, yeah. Mm, around half the album, I think. Yeah? Yeah, just finished the first track. Sent it off to him yesterday, digging into the second one today. On a break at the moment. Snuck out here on a furlough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From my lair. Are you, um, since I've uh, worked with you, what have you been doing record-wise and label-wise and everything? Have you guys been putting stuff out? You put out the killer stuff on vinyl. Yep. And then what has Bongload been doing since those three years of us uh, hanging out? Yeah, so we did a bunch of vinyl uh, reissue stuff. Uh, some stuff from connected to my past. We put out a, a book version of The Killers, which wasn't connected to my past, just uh, there's the Vegas connection. And, uh, and they were friends of Mike Stratton's. Uh, the, um, who was running Bongload. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I did a Richard Thompson record. Uh, oh, really? On vinyl, which I'd produced in 1999. We put a 20-year uh, anna anniversary out on that. And uh, now we have a new, I'm not doing any legacy stuff this year. Uh, we've got a new band called Hollywood Hex, which is a duo, a guy and a girl, two-piece, uh, part live, part electronic, uh, really, really up my alley, uh, able to draw, uh, the guy's really into Nine Inch Nails, and, uh, uh, he really likes, uh, old break beats, uh, like I used to do with Beck, oh, wow. 20 some years ago, yeah. and so we've been digging into that sort of space, somewhere between, uh, Nine Inch Nails and Beck, Writing stuff together, finding our own grooves, and uh, and making stuff uh, completely fresh. And we've got a seven-inch single just in the uh, just arrived at the lair uh, in boxes. So we're going to put that together. And uh, yeah, so that's a. Uh, we also put out uh, went around the time of the last podcast. Uh, speaking of new music as well, we also put out the vinyl pressing, the only vinyl pressing of the Killers bass player's second record, uh, Mark from the Killers, uh, which is uh, is both his solo albums are. Uh, are uh, amazing but that second one is whew, really really good and uh uh really uh yeah my cup of tea so yeah excited to be doing new music again and we didn't get involved in the making of uh mark's record uh and dark arts but we uh we pressed it out back then so now this is the first thing hollywood hex this is the first band i mean your record was gonna be the first thing i was gonna be involved with the production that had come out on bongo in a long time this is the first seven inch single we've done i think since the 90s uh, that's in, incredible. In, into the 90s. So, yeah, yeah. So, that's that's what I'm up to. Uh, and mixing these James Blunt records. Uh, I was in Spain, saw him at his house a couple weeks ago. Uh, we were kicking it around. He started playing me some new stuff. And he's like, hey, you know what? Uh, you should mix some of these. I said, okay. And so, uh, uh, I was going to do it up in my studio in Humboldt in Northern California. Got to LAX the other night from Barcelona. We got delayed over a weekend. Things got thrown out of whack. Some business came up in Vegas. I'm like, ah, you know what? We'll take it to the lair in Vegas and uh, and mix it there. And uh, uh, and then you messaged me in the airport. It's just on the ground in LAX. You're like, hey, dude, I'm going to be in Vegas. I said, no way. So, uh, yeah, so popped over and uh, today to do the podcast. Amazing. Perfect timing. Do you pursue signing bands still these days, or does it have to be something that really mm. um, makes sense? to? Because we're talking about putting out records, especially if you're an, uh, an indie label like yourself. It's not like the old days like Beck where you put it out and it sold millions. Um, do you, is there any interest in signing bands and putting records out, or is there any point to well, that? The value, as we all know, of recorded music just plummeted from like about year 2000 onwards, so almost 20 years now. However, 17, 18, somewhere in there, it started to come off the bottom. So uh, partially because of streaming and YouTube, uh, YouTube and Spotify, not just streaming services, but you know things like uh, where it just plays on the internet, like YouTube. So uh, in that sense, in the sense of being an indie label or an aspiring musician, I, I'm encouraging people at the moment when they ask me, like, should, you know, sometimes parents will come up at the age I'm at now and say, hey, my kid's starting to play guitar. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good time. Uh, why not? It was never an easy business. Uh, one sidebar we didn't talk about last time, I'll say since you mentioned James Blunt, he was uh, a British military officer, a captain, and uh, he was the... As captain, he was the head of the ground forces that went into Kosovo when uh, their ethnic cleansing was going on. And uh, so when I met him, I thought, this is going to be great. He was while we were making his debut album. 
and uh, 2003. And I thought, this is great that you've done all this active military stuff. I mean, his stories were like, and he didn't, it wasn't something he really talked about, but over the course of working together on his first album back then, 15 years ago or so, over the course of working on that album for months and months and months, slowly he just told some stories, kind of as they're relevant to working together. And some, some of the material in the record was about the, the experiences in the military and that period of his life. And so slowly we talked about a little bit of it. And uh, uh, I thought, you know, this is going to be great. This is a great prerequisite for being in entertainment, having seen, uh, but his, the stuff, the stories that he reveal, revealed were like, I was pretty, I wasn't shocked, but it was interesting to talk to a guy it's like this, face to face, sitting across, sitting next to him in a chair, who has, you know, seen full on like Hearts of Darkness, Apocalypse Now action. I mean, the real stuff. Uh, face, you know, walk in a room, guys exploded, splattered over the walls. You got to deal with it. And, uh, and hope you don't trip another booby trap and blow yourself up. Years after it all happened, and, uh, you know, we're on, it's on about LP3 or so, many years now into this success. And that album that we made, that debut, when we were talking first about these military stories, was in the trash can, was never going to come out, ended up being the best-selling album of the last decade. So it barely happened. But when it did, it happened big. And then after that, several years in, I dropped by and saw him in Spain one time, and uh, he mentioned something about the damage done meaning the damage that happens to you, to anyone, let's not kid ourselves, from high-level uh, public exposure. And, uh, and I said, wait a minute, time out. You're telling me that being an entertainer has taken more of a toll on you than active military service? He said, absolutely. Oh, man. So, I believe that. I believe that. I mean, the way that if you look around Hollywood or Nashville or New York... Uh, the amount of shell-shocked ex-performers that didn't make it, it, it the, they're just, it, they're gone. Yeah. To no, to no coming back. And I, I really don't, I really don't know how you get there because I always look at it as, is like, if you don't expect to get big and you're doing the thing, then you've made it. Yeah. Like I look at yes. it. A lot of people look at me like I remember some guy. He introduced me as a failed musician, now successful comedy, a comedian. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm not a successful comedian and I'm not a failed musician. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a working artist. For thirty four years now, always have been. Yeah. So how can how can it be failed musician? It's only you're only measuring it by monetary success or fame. The only thing you could say is former musician, current comedian. One hundred percent artist for uh, and and All I'm not trying through. to be some like I'm an artist, <laughs> but what I'm saying is like it's weird. Uh, my point is when people look at it that way. Um, but I'm saying when the person doing the art looks at it this way, they're set up to fail. They're yeah, yeah. already done because they're only looking, they're hoping that this is their way out. I'm going to make some money and buy a home and, 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 and be rich and famous. And that's just crazy. Totally crazy. But to answer your last question, which I didn't even slightly answer, uh, uh, Throughout the, I would call the really active production portion of my life, which I haven't been nearly as active in uh, in new productions uh, the last six years, and I slowed it down for I've been slowing it down for twenty years, and the last six has been crickets uh, intentionally uh, because what it takes to do it and what it takes out of you, and uh, so no, I'm not even though I'm working with a new act now, and and through bong load, it's not something that I'm going out. It's like I'm not on social media every day. Sk- skimming for artists and youtube and trying to find stuff uh going to clubs uh tips uh so yeah i'm super it's super super rare uh yeah that's what i was telling uh vega the uh, leader of hollywood hex's uh lawyer uh slash manager the killer he's from the killers camp is uh his same uh, same legal team and management team that's the vegas connection here and uh to hollywood hex but the uh i was telling them like you know it's super rare that, that I do this ever at all at this point. And uh, that being said, though, I got hit up on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, uh, as I do, 
by somebody like, hey, I got some demos. You want to take a listen? And uh, I clicked on a clip of this kid from Ireland, and uh, it's so good. So every once in a while, you hear something that's so good, you just want to do it. That's why I put out uh, Mark from the Killers' uh, second solo record on vinyl on Bong Load. Because uh, I heard it, and I was like, this is why I did it in the first place. I heard the first few notes of the first song, and I was like, this is, this is where it's at. And the, you, you can just tell sometimes. Uh, it's like judging the book by the cover. I heard the first bar of his record, and I knew the whole record was going to be good, and I knew it was re- my total cup of tea. And it was, and it is. And uh, so, yeah, but it's super rare that I, uh, that I get involved in, uh, in people's careers at this point. Do you, because um, this is how I kind of operate, are you able to, I mean, obviously you are because you're doing it this way, but I'm not able to be kind of in sometimes i'm either all in or i would be all the way out like doing something like i don't know living in boulder or nashville or something and just a job or or i don't know i i never think about i couldn't do well part-time yeah and that's i know what you're saying uh which is why i don't do a full-time uh songwriting career songwriting slash music production, which is a lot of my peers. You know, when the sales started going down, everybody started clumping together because there used to be songwriters and sometimes they'd produce and there used to be producers and sometimes they'd songwrite. But then it got kind of glued together because the money was so small. Like, shit, we had to do both. And uh, which was kind of like Instagram affecting comedy with short clips. It was a travesty for recorded music uh, because everybody that was primarily a songwriter insisted on being a producer. Uh which wasn't the best thing for music because you might be great at writing songs. You're not necessarily a good producer. Uh, in my case, it didn't, I didn't go, I didn't go down that rabbit hole and I really thought a lot about it and I did some sessions, but one problem with it was everything that I was associated with at that point was massively labor intensive. So for me to make like a song demo, might take a week or two for one song and these guys would be turning out you know you take several cuts you gotta write a bunch of songs and produce them to get a hit i mean not to get a hit but get a placement get something that goes on to a record tv shows records anything yeah you gotta make a lot it's a it's a game of numbers yeah and uh and i had always produced with a uh quality first quantity second and so what i was known for so i couldn't like start turning out what to me would be half-assed song demos they'd be going wow Rothrock really freaking lost it listen to this crap but on one hand I, I wasn't going to do that it'd be soul sucking anyway but I but if I had done that people would have thought I'd lost the plot but so what was I left with the only alternative I had was to make full on finished masters that were re- of the quality uh, the complexity intelligence and orchestration of the productions that I was known for and uh, but you know I wouldn't turn out the volume enough to make a living. So there was, that really wasn't an option for me. But it was fortunate that that was at a time when I was ready to slow down anyway because you can't kind of sort of, sort of do it. Uh, but uh, I'm all in musically, or I'm all in music business-wise right now. It's just different. It is my daily routine. It's not, uh, not active uh, record production. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it is, uh, uh, I do regularly make music, though. Not, not other people's, myself. And... Uh, so I keep the axe sharp there, uh, and uh, which is something that I started off enjoying. I still enjoy keeping the axe sharp. So when James wants says you want to mix some stuff, I'm like, yeah, my computer's up to date, my plugins are up to date, my my studio's all in cases and, and uh, rolls out. It's up in humble. It's been up in humble the last couple of years, and uh, uh, so yeah, it's uh, uh, it's something that I love to do. But I totally hear you on the sort of doing something. Yeah, you, you can't. And uh, like I said, that's why I didn't get active in songwriting. There was a logistical. Uh, trickiness of turning out the volume uh, but uh, uh, there was just the uh, you've just got to do it all the time and uh, I haven't found anybody and sure I'm sure there's probably someone out there like when people say there's no no new good music and you say you know you're not listening far enough yeah Uh, but man everybody that turns out high volumes of songwriting stuff to try to go after hits uh, they just don't they can be really I, they, I can really admire some of the people that are good at it I have some old peers and friends that do it uh, and I appreciate the technique but it, to me it just doesn't make for good music nope. I mean you know, what if Elliot Smith one day just like put the guitar down and said you know what I'm tired of being out on the road I'm just gonna songwrite and just crank out about five songs a day I, I, you and I could easily do that right now <laughs> but it would just be like it's true it would just be like ugh I mean I've gone and wrote with some friends of mine for uh, TV placement and you get in there and you just whip up a couple songs in a day. 
But if it was your record, no way yeah. would that stuff even be on the record. But it's just stuff, especially when you're writing stuff for, say, TV shows, like let's say, uh, uh, you know, background stuff for like uh, Sons of Anarchy, let's say, you know. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, so the bikes are going by and here comes the chorus. It's like, look out, stranger. There's a ghost on your shoulder. You know, that kind of, you already know the formula. You, totally. know, you know what I mean? With the wind on your back. And the evil behind you, you know, wow. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. And, and the verses don't mean anything because you're just putting some things together just to turn in the song. But it's a, that's an interesting, uh, uh, because now it's not really art. It's, a, it's like a, um, it's just a, a, a revenue stream. Hopefully, if you can get some songs placed. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. then you got a lot of these songs, and you're shopping them along, and then you'll write a good one, and you'll go, man, I'm going to keep this one Hide over this here. One. <laughs> you're not even doing anything, but you're like, eh, because you're... It's, exactly. Writing songs is a lot like um, joke writing. You have to write a lot of songs to understand um, songwriting and to get something, get somewhere. But to me, the hardest part was writing some lyrics, and that's the same as writing jokes, that weren't like, here comes the old chorus again, here's that, that thing. And we've all heard every lyric there is, and most jokes are what's going on in life. It comes down to the same old thing. What is your voice on it? What is yeah. your spin on it? And that's what makes it amazing. Yep. It's, it's really a... It's a wild world doing art in this uh, landscape. And, and to be in the uh, business like you are. Thank God that you have this back catalog and vinyl's hot. And you can put out stuff. Sam's Town's one of the greatest records uh, that came out in the last 20 years by the Killers. And to have that on vinyl is fantastic. Or the Beck stuff. Yeah. Any of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, dealing in quality, for sure. I think, I truly believe this. Uh, I always believe that people come into my life for a reason. And, uh, and I don't even remember how we met. Uh, was it just on Instagram, or how did we meet? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was Instagram. I think yeah. Michael Stratton, I think, dinged you and said, hey, you should have Tom on the podcast. And you're like, yeah, and then you've messaged me. Oh, that's me. right. That's yeah. how it was. I yep. forgot. That's what it was. That was it. I believe people come into my life for a, a reason. And, and like I said, I've worked with a lot of people in the music business and now in comedy. And I really felt that there was something there. So I definitely wanted to sit down with you again and also say sorry, man, that I didn't want to put that out. <laughs> I'd never really been in that, um, in that situation where... Uh, I'm used to, uh, like, I'm used to being in control, but not, I don't think it's in a, in a, uh, a bad way. Uh, yeah. I am rising up, but I also do have a, uh, a, um, a, a concern of what I want to do. And since I don't have any money, sometimes it, it gets to that thing of like, fuck it, let's just put it out. But then it's like, nah, let's don't do that. Let's sell this thing in the garage we're not using and keep going. So that's kind of cool, you know. I, I really want you to come see uh, comedy now. It's been a few years and, and see what you see different. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. That'd be great. Yeah, as a producer and a friend. Let's do you it. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you going to come to any of the shows this weekend? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. that'd be great. Afterwards, let's figure one out for sure. Yeah, all right. Yeah, love to come down. So what do you got coming up? You're doing the James Blunt mixes. James Blunt mixes, the Hollywood Hex single and video. Uh, it's getting finished right now. And, you got a uh, YouTube channel going to come out, right? Yep, yep, yep. And we're going to crank up a bongo YouTube channel, which we've never properly done. And uh, so that's going to be the, as we're not doing uh, any reissues on vinyl this year, that's going to be the thrust into new music and, uh, and the YouTube channel. Yeah, and we're going to yeah. dust off some of the stuff we filmed. Yes. And put out some clips. Yeah, which, which would be I'm, rad. Well, yeah, which I'm kind of looking forward to that because I also do think that eventually uh, when I say, all right, uh, even if I uh, do a Netflix 15 or whatever or I do a special, 
I do think that you and I should put out the record together still as like, look, man, this is where we started years ago. And then here it is. Because that stuff's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you look back at it, you go, oh, wow. Thank goodness it exists. Like the Aretha Franklin movie that my friend Alan Elliott uh, uh, championed that's just now out uh, from the church. It's like, whew, so good. I haven't seen so, so any good. of it. Amazing Grace. No, you haven't seen it? No, I've seen, I haven't seen any of the footage that we, we <laughs> shot. <laughs> Have you seen the Aretha Franklin film? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what about Rolling Thunder? That thing was in the... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. In the, uh, that kind of stuff. The, we got this stuff in the can. Yep. And maybe it didn't come out when it did, but eventually it does come out. Exactly. And you really go, oh, that fucking Dean's a lunatic. It, you know, when you said you didn't want to, uh, you weren't sure, it's kind of how, you know, we, we didn't push you, we didn't try to force it. It's just, I, I, I believe, as I think you do, that this stuff, it, natu- it happens as it naturally should. Yeah. And, uh, of course, you know, the same way you're saying, like, oh, gosh, you know, uh, it'd be great to, you know, sell some of these and make some revenue and uh, augment my income from the shows or whatever. Uh, same thing, too. I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, we spent this time and money uh, putting this thing in the can, audio and video. Uh, and uh, it'd be great to get some return on that. But, you know, when you said you weren't feeling comfortable, I was like, yeah, well, last thing anyone wants to do is, you know, try to convince somebody to put out something they're not comfortable with. Right. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not how I uh, have ever uh, ever conducted things. So I was never upset, I guess is what I'm saying, uh, by that. And, uh, uh, oh, you know, and, and we didn't talk about it all before. And uh, the flip side of what I was just talking about, uh, not getting so, uh, rarely getting involved in other people's careers musically. But the last 10 years, I decided at one point when I was like, man, I'm not going to be like a, a, a song factory songwriter churning out cheeseburgers of songs. Uh, and uh, I thought, but you know what I haven't done is I haven't gone out and, uh, and performed. And so I thought, you know what, I spent a whole lifetime in the studio creating songs, and then I hand them off to my friends and artists, and they go out and perform them, and I lose the connection. We may have like a really deep connection together with the music, but it's sort of like I'm a surrogate. You know, I, I, I hatch these things, and then they go out. And uh, so, you know, I'm going to make some music and, uh, and go out and play it. And around that same time that I was scratching my head, like, what to do next? I thought about film composing, but I was like, well, I'm a little late to this party because it, as the record uh, budgets were going down because the recording industry was collapsing, around 2000 uh, a little bit after that when i was working on great films like uh spongebob and shrek 2 and collateral on the same year except whole month period i'm working on all these amazing films musically uh but i'm looking at that going Ooh, a little late to this party the, you know those budgets are collapsing as well i'm like what am i going to do and that's when i thought you know i haven't performed and uh and so i uh made some electronic music around the same time i dj'd uh a uh, an internet party uh, an internet uh, podcast type of thing, an internet radio show that would go out monthly, uh, and uh, and it was in a party environment. And uh, I used to be a college radio DJ when I when I first began, and I went and DJed. I never DJed in front of people, and uh, I played this party uh, live to the internet, and uh, uh, it was so fun. I thought, shit, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to perform, and I'll do it with. Uh, I've been hanging out in Ibiza a bunch anyway. I'm going to do it uh, with Dex and electronically. And as soon as I started doing that, I started bringing in live musicians. And so uh, several times a year, uh, we, uh, we do this uh, live show with the DJ, while I'm DJing and uh, my friends are playing. And that's, I love doing that. We do a lot of privates and whatnot. I love the, love the, uh, the private gigs and, uh, and some public ones as well. But uh, just did a, a round of it uh, in Ibiza. And uh, yeah, so anyway, performing has been the... Uh, uh, the counterbalance or, or whatever we'd call it. It's been a thing that I've really, really enjoyed uh, in the past uh, 10 years. I think it's the last, um, the last organic plane out there. Uh, like I look at doing comedy or plays or, or even DJing. A lot of people knock DJs. that They, they don't understand that. That ain't music and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And here we are in Vegas in um, the DJ capital, one of the DJ capitals of the world besides Ibiza and New York. Uh, we got Marshmallow, Skrillex, all, all these guys out here, uh, Dead Mouse, all these guys making million, million dollar, super million dollar, multi-million dollar deals yeah. uh, doing residencies. And um, it, it's a fascinating world. And I look at it is almost you could be one of those Vegas DJs because you have a persona, a vibe, a deep connection with music. I wouldn't even be surprised if one year all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I signed a residency over there at the uh, Wynn, 
and it's Roth Rock, you know? <laughs> I mean, because they all, they're like rock stars now, and they all yeah. have a thing, a mask, a vibe, some kind of thing. I mean, Skrillex, I remember I was going to interview him like four years ago. I knew him for 20 years back when he played oh, wow. music. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I ended up doing some commercial for them, TV commercial for a festival. And uh, so I watched some uh, deep rabbit hole footage on YouTube. And he went on tour of like um, Mexico. And he had, a, he had like the spaceship. Like uh, it was like P-Funk style. It flew into the crowd. People going crazy. And I just sat there and thought like, if people don't get this, yeah, the people didn't get stuff we were into. Yeah. And people didn't get stuff that our parents were into, that 60s counterculture, that hippie stuff, the 70s stoner rock, the prog rock, uh, country music, you know, anything. At one time, people were like, that's garbage. But uh, that stuff out there is real, and it's, it's, it's interesting um, how it's been around forever now. These people that still go, DJ, and that ain't music. Hey, man, this shit's been around since uh, Kraftwerk. If you want to get into techno and that whole kind of sound, Kraftwerk, of course, not DJs, but I'm saying that, that kind of vibe yeah. at live gigs. And that's a, that's a, and, and I look at it as a cool culture because it's a drug, a drug world where they're out there, they're getting high, they're finding, they're going for it, trying to find some kind of feeling or whatever. Yeah. And that's the same thing when I was young, getting high, playing rock and roll, going to concerts, meeting people, getting out of the house. Yeah. Getting out of the house, man. That's a rare thing for a lot of people. Right. People don't get out of the house. You're, you're a lot like me. You've traveled the globe and you learn stuff every day, like your son uh, travels with you and he gets to learn stuff. And that's way more than any kind of textbook stuff or computer stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it still remains my favorite. If I don't have a, something on the calendar, uh, you know, in the next few weeks, whatever, I go crazy. If there's not, yeah, I need a constant itinerary to, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I love it. It's the only thing I've found that you can do where you go about a daily routine. You know what you've got to do. Like, okay, it could be the most mundane day on the road. So you've got to get up and get out of the hotel by a certain time, to get in a car in a certain time, to get to the airport by a certain time, to land in another place and get to another hotel. But in the course of doing that, you'll have life experiences. Things will happen that would not happen sitting around the house and going to the same job back and forth. Uh, I just find, yeah, I find it super rich. You don't have to be, exert any effort and you're getting enriched by traveling. Uh, it's just amazing. Oh, even the most monotonous stuff of like, ah, oh, I got to get to the airport. I hate this. But the stuff that you're taking in to your mind and, and living yeah. And living, you know, like, I think that you're a lot like me. I, I think a lot of times, like, oh, I'd love just to sit home. And then you're home for a couple of weeks and they're like, I got to get that. out of here. Hey, exactly. Yeah, you know, I was in New York <laughs> 10 months straight and I was like, I got to get out of here for a while. And now I'm like, I can't wait till I get back there next week. It's such a. And yeah. uh, what do you think that is in us? Is Do you think it's an artistic thing or are we just crazy or what is it? Like, we we can't. Our, our, our brains rattle? Our crazy goes without saying, but uh, beyond <laughs> that, uh, yeah, why is it? I don't know. The, uh, you know, maybe uh, it, just, it does seem like ancestral uh, lineage plays into people's makeup. Yeah, I know some Viking dudes the last few years, I meet guys from that part of the world where they have Viking ancestry, and you can see in them aspects of what you think a Viking to be, the, the stereotypical uh, sort of must conquer manly you know they're, they're i know a couple of viking men and uh uh yeah so i think you know maybe i was nomadic maybe you were nomadic at one point uh uh in our lineage you know like uh, descendants of uh, nomadic people uh and maybe some people are are descendants of people that weren't nomadic and uh uh i have a, a dear friend from uh first grade who's five days younger than me and uh 
Uh, so, you know, you think like, well, these guys ought to be pretty much the same. He's completely happy not traveling very much. He likes to travel too, but he's really happy not traveling. And if he traveled as much as I did, I get the sense he'd probably be upset. Uh, whereas I've gone up and seen him, you know, up, up in Humboldt where we grew up, I've gone up and seen him uh, up there and thinking like, dude, you haven't been out much. Are you okay? And he's yeah. like, yeah, what? <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm clearly the crazy one. <laughs> I'm always afraid that roots might get too deep. Right. And then I can't get up and walk. <laughs> I think it's really the fear of seeing um, a lot of people unhappy that didn't go for something. I really uh, think that's the uh, what what keeps me driving. Of like, yeah. you know, I, uh, I I don't know specifically why I must do comedy every day. I know that I absolutely love it. But I can't imagine not doing it. And so I think, I sit there and think, like, this is crazy. I'm 53, going to be 54. And I don't think about at all just chilling. If I did, then I'm out. I'm out. If I start having fantasies of, like, yeah, owning a home, living here for good, done. I, I remember I was telling Marin. <laughs> I go, man, I'm not going to go do, I wouldn't do something like that. I would just get a job. And he goes, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> he was so right. Because I had jobs. They're scary as fuck. And at first yeah. I thought it was good. Selling motorcycles, making money. I'm yeah. like, this is a great back end of my life. And then I was like, this ain't good. I'm just <laughs> spending money trying to fill holes in my heart. And really all I want to do is art. I've almost sold everything now. Sold the records, Tom. What? Sold them all. Those records you had last time I was over? Yeah. Whoa. They're gone. Wow. Yeah. Getting and, super minimal. Yeah. I, I Great. Re I'm, I look at it now as the back half of my life of, I don't really want to have anything. I've been, I've been uh, I'm not as far down that road as you. We're the same age, but uh, I have been uh, very aware of, the first part of adult life, the build, building career, you know, building musical instruments, whatever, collecting, gathering, go, 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 achieve a mass, a mass, a mass, and definitely have been, uh, now it's simplify, 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 streamline, streamline, and I'm really, every little thing, you know, every time I get a, uh, a box of stuff for Goodwill or something, I just pull the t-shirt out of my way over here, like, oh, this one shrunk down, doesn't fit me, great, I can put it in the pile for donation, and uh, I, anything I can get, I love it, it feels better and better and better, and I did, I've done that also by simplifying my commitments in the music business i still have a, a a full round of stuff that i'm responsible for and working on but all the stuff that's non-essential i've weeded out and uh, uh getting more and more command over your own time is just uh it's so liberating it's key and i think there's an aspect of that by the sounds of it with what you're doing with the uh doing comedy every day and simplifying your life at the same time yeah do you find when you're out in your airstream because you have an airstream yeah. and that's a dream of mine to have one uh I always loved that thing when Sean Penn's house burned down. He just lived in an Airstream in Malibu. Kind of like <laughs> oh, really? Rock, Rockford, Jim Rockford on Rockford well, Files. You know what? I pull up in front of uh, my friend Kurt's place in Burbank all the time. He's an animator, so he lives in Burbank. It's perfect. He lives on this beautiful tree-lined shaded street. And uh, uh, I had to be like, hey, dude, I'm landing in L.A. tomorrow. Uh, can I Rockford it up in front of your house? Which means <laughs> when I get the Airstream, can yeah. I just pull up in front of your house? <laughs> 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 the tree line Burbank Street. Even though it's an it's Airstream, perfect. a beautiful one, people are like, who's that homeless guy doing here? Yeah, the neighbors, they eventually got used to me. Uh, people would be walking their dogs on the sidewalk in the morning. I'm coming out like, like Jim Rockford, and then, you know, yeah. they're across the street. <laughs> yeah. But my point is when you're in your Airstream somewhere, say out on the mountain property there and stuff, do you find yourself like thinking, this is all I really need? The Airstream? Yeah, you know, I got an Airstream when I went to the dealership, and I thought these are so amazing. Let's get the smallest one that'll work. The and, Bambi. Uh, yeah, and uh, so I was looking at Bambi 19, the next size off the bottom, and then I ended up getting a 22, and I was completely happy. Then our son was born, and I was like, oh, we don't fit in it. Crap! So I had to go up and get the 25. So I was only ever going to buy one in my life. I ended up buying two, and I went back to you know swap it out you know i in fact i wouldn't even want to be a day without one i i had the other one for a few months overlapping and stuff i didn't even 
couldn't, you know. And I said to the guy, like, yeah, just weird. I never want to get rid of it. He's like, people never sell these things. He says, when they are going through hard times in their life, it's the thing they will hold on to the longest. He said, because it represents, it's not even if they're using it, it's what it represents. But then it also, it's super practical. I mean, it's a complete house. It's, uh, it's minimalist and all the things why you know and why, why there's a huge culture around those things. And irrational, too. They're overpriced. They're, they're uh, somewhat inconvenient. They're kind of small compared to contemporary RVs. But still, man, they just it, talk about hit, hit song, you know, talk about timeless. Uh, they really, really work. So, yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely love it. And so, no, I, I, uh, uh, yeah, there's an aspect of that. I mean, I spent about three and a half months in it last year, and uh, you know, got a great place. And I, in the three and a half months, I was out in the uh, northwestern United States, and a bunch of the time at my ranch, uh, from April to uh, through Bernie Man, I was out. So yeah, I spent more than three and a half months. The six months of the year, in the middle of last year, from April uh, until Labor Day. Uh, I or different uh, friends or family, we were all out in the airstream in different configurations for the vast majority of that time. And meanwhile, I had this amazing like five bedroom house outside London, just with crickets, you know, like it's like my friend uh, coming by and mowing the lawn on it and checking on it, and uh, and I'm in the airstream. So uh, so I guess I'm. Well, I want to say no to your question, but yeah, I guess I could. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I definitely just not get rid of it because yeah. what happened was I was in, it, in my apartment in New York and uh, everything was in storage, and after ten months, I couldn't even tell you what was in storage anymore, and the outfits and the Bluetooth speakers I had in there and uh, and. It was just kind of like in, in, in a, a travel bag, and I was like, "This is this is it." Yeah, I don't miss anything. At this point, I perpetually keep my, which now microscopic, you know, the, the carry-on luggage that they'll let you take on any airline. Yeah, uh, I keep that thing packed. All it's packed right now uh, for when I came in uh, Monday night, and uh, but. Uh, yeah, I, but it's it's always packed. It's always with me. Is it and, a backpack uh, or a lo- piece of luggage? It's a piece of luggage, and I've got a messenger bag. Uh, and then yeah, if I know some flights will only let you take that one thing, some will let you take the personal item as well. So I've got a messenger bag that's made out of all recycled material that I just love. This German-made thing that's like a fire hose for a strap and and some carpet for a exterior shell you know i got that thing and i've got my little tiny rollerboard bag and they're always packed you know it has its own shave bag separate from uh, uh, at the loft and uh, in it and it's just ready to go and uh yeah it's uh i yeah it's so between the you know it's pretty, pretty minimal now that house i had in hollywood for 13 or 14 years where my studio was out of uh that uh sold to the uh, electronic uh music people uh, i'm the opposite now I, it's, it's all my stuff's pretty darn minimal uh, and my studio is minimal. I've still got all the, all the full line in in, uh, in cases and whatnot. And like I say, it's up in the barn in Humboldt right now. The barn I built a studio in the '90s in Humboldt uh, around '92, '93, and uh, and I still got it. And uh, on the family farm, and uh, it's a great space. So I'm able to keep my full. I kind of like live two lives. I've got a full back line of uh, classic studio equipment and instruments. That's the original place, like where you did Beck and all that. Yeah, Beck first Fu Manchu album, mixed first Foo Fighters album there. That's where I booked the first. We were hit on this last time. I booked the first ever public Foo Fighters gig at a bar there. They played a uh, uh, dormitory, a keg party in a uh, Seattle University dorm, like the week or two before, and uh, and uh, first ever public gig. So yeah, we did a lot of classic stuff there in the '90s, and then I mothballed it while I had the studio in LA for those 12, 13 years, and then we unmothballed it two years ago. And in fact, yeah, I was going to be there now, but. Fortunately, I'm not because we're sitting here talking, which is awesome. And uh, <laughs> in a week or two, I'm going to go up there. And uh, uh, that's what my sort of uh, annual migration. I was watching that documentary with the guy that was flying with the geese, you know, like in his ultralight thing. Oh, boom, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Strapping cameras on him and stuff. And I was like, yeah, obviously, I'm nomadic, but let's just like pay a little closer attention to nature. The birds have got to figure it figured out. They're like, hey, dude. Yeah, it's cool here, but in a few weeks, the weather's going to get shitty. So we go down to Mexico, and we hang out there, and they, they got this annual routine, right? Those birds, they know where to go around the world at what month. Boom, boom, boom. So that's what I've been working on the last few years is, like, setting up my annual migration. And I think it's going to involve full-on music production in Humboldt in the summers. Uh, July, August, September months in Humboldt are just off the charts. Beautiful. And uh, and I think uh, winter's in, a, in Ibiza. It's, that's uh, cool. Yeah. Have uh, one last question before you go. Have you thought about you being from Humboldt, and that was the original weed world? Yeah. Uh, the Emerald Triangle. 
and mm-hmm. all the weed and everything that was going on up there. If you think back to those days of camp, and oh, uh, I lived it. That was my childhood. Yeah, yeah that was real. That was real. We saw those helicopters flying it, over. And then that whole thing of like, um, what was the paraquat? <laughs> you know, <Yep. laughs> uh, yeah, spray, we sprayed the fields with paraquat. You smoke that weed, it's poison it's now. It's a freaking Agent Orange of the growing world. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But when you think about that now, and and legal. It and and legal because off. my point is, uh, everybody turned uh, a blind eye up there uh, in Humboldt because once the lumber business was gone, the logging business, yeah. if the weed business was gone, the entire Humboldt would have been out of business. There was a dude in high school who had the most genius T-shirt ever. He'd wear yeah, about once a week. He could come up in his rotation and it said, all Humboldt County's fishing and logging has gone to pot. <laughs> my point is now that we're in vegas have you ever thought about getting into the uh weed world the because green sector huh the green sector yeah 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 because of the cbd uh industry and all that you know yeah it, and as when uh, a couple years ago when the legal vote was coming up for recreation in california and nevada uh stratton was talking about that in the context of bongload records he's like you know we could do a thing we could, uh, you know, talk to people in Santa Cruz or something. You know, maybe there's a strain to be made. Maybe there's a bong load strain uh, to be made. Maybe there's some sort of way to interface with the industry uh, and do something. I also, my cousin's a chemist, and I looked into uh, creating a compound for pressing vinyl that would uh, use hemp plastic. Wow. Uh, we looked into that as well. So, yeah, the green sector is, I grew up in it. I understand it. Uh, you know, I've had known people in it and kids of people in it for my whole life. Uh and, uh, you know, know the light side, know the dark side. And a uh, uh, buddy down the road was killed when he was uh, 18 in a grow. Uh, oh, and incidentally, you know that show on Netflix, uh, Murder Mountain? Oh, yeah, Murder Every- Mountain. Everybody was saying, Tom, Tom, if you watch this, if you watch it. I was like, no, no, no. I didn't really want to. I live there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't really want to watch it. Finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to watch it because everybody's asking me. People would equ- equal amounts of people would ask me because they thought I'd be interested in it. They'd know I was from Humboldt. And an equal amount of people knew I was from Humboldt, and it's like, so you know, I'm going to watch it. And uh, and it, and uh, and then a friend of mine's buddy's the one that uh, the one that made it. And uh, there's a backstory on that too. Uh, you know, that guy went up apparently that made it with his buddies to do a grow. You know, like that. Yeah. The, the gold rush, the green rush, as they call it now, but like in the in the 1800s, like the gold rush, they went out like, hey, we'll make some money. And uh, apparently they got ripped off, and we're like, oh shoot, they got shit mixed. And they're like, what are we gonna do now? And uh, oh well, fuck it. Well, let's, we know to make film. Let's let's make a documentary about. It. Now that we're in the community, and we got some inroads, let's just use it to make a. And so they made the Murder Mountain series. So I knew knew friends of friends did, made the series. People asked me to watch the series. So finally, I broke down a few months ago and watched it. And uh, uh, and they did a great job. And it's really accurate. And it, that was my childhood. So that was all cool. The only thing I, I I'm going to say on your podcast to add to it is. Uh, it's incredibly accurate and whatnot, but the one thing that they do, which is just, you know, good filmmaking or TV or whatever you want to call it. They build the drama? No, the, actually, they could have probably could have got more drama. You would not believe the things that happened. Oh. In that sense, it was kind of tame, but, uh, uh, but what was, we romanticize things uh, when we, when, and it's not, not even just in film and television, but in media, but we romanticize things when we look back on memories. So they kept, in the TV show, showing an era when it was lovey and dovey and hippies dancing around naked and, and, you know, trimming and shit. Yeah, okay. But, and then they're like, but now it's, you know, dark and, you know, people are getting killed. Well, yeah, but in 83, my buddy got killed on a grow. People were getting killed so, back then. Yeah. It, I remember it, that. It, it's always booby been, traps. Bo- uh, th- we, in high school, that was a real thing. And yeah. we, we, we found booby traps. Yep. So the gag was what people would do is on a trail in, and they'd, they'd, they'd take big steps. If you had a dude with a grow, you know, taking big steps, odd steps try, through the grass, trying to not make a path through the brush into his grow. But we learned how to detect us when we were kids and find them. And the classic booby trap there, the, the guys that came back from Nam that were growing, would uh, put a shotgun shell. Yeah, bury it in the ground with a bunch of nut, bolts and and, uh, and nails and whatever the sh- rusty shit they could find, scrap metal, in with it, under, and put that on top of it, and then cover the thing over, and then they'd put a, uh, a trip wire to it. I and, remember that. And so you'd walk through this like you know spider web type of trip wire, super thin thing you notice, and it'd blow up, and uh, uh, and that stuff was real. And so I didn't encounter one of those, but we became aware of it. Thank goodness, you know, we were all talking at school, and they're kids, are growers, and stuff. We, uh, we knew a bit of what was going on, and uh, in our adventures of finding other people's grows, 
uh, around the neighborhood uh, multiple times. We came into uh, the poor man's version of that. Thank goodness, the poor man's version. But what they would do, these, uh, these hippie dudes, the non-Vietnam guys, they would do the same thing, except they tie a piece of thread across. And we learned to walk in such a way that we would not break the thread. We'd feel it and back off. Because the whole point of the thread was, A, to scare you, obviously, and B, well, the first few times we came on across the thread, we tripped it, and we're like, fuck, that could have been a shotgun. Yeah. But it wasn't. And, uh, uh, but it was so thin, so we learned to detect them and, uh, and not break them. But the whole point of the thread was, for rookies like us, is to walk through and break it, and the guy knows, somebody knows my grow, and then he gets vigilant. He puts dogs there, he stays there all the time as it gets closer to harvest. So it was like, it was like an alert for him. Yeah. It was, it was like the, before those light sensors. Yeah, know, yeah, the light, the light beams. Yeah. yeah, the lasers. He broke the laser. Yeah, totally like, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the super poor man hippie version of it, a thread between two stinging nettles or something. But yeah, that was, yeah, that was my childhood. So yeah, uh, yes, we have thought about the green sector and uh yeah uh and it changes so fast and rapidly too it does. there's aspects of it that i understand and know from forever the culture and whatnot is, is somewhat the same uh but the uh like music and entertainment and uh social media and digital and you know the coming ai it's all changing so fast but no we haven't no uh no plans to share about getting into the green sector but it's a funny you bring it up because it's always pretty much on the front of the mind yeah well it was great to talk to you again man and uh, it's always good to see you. And, and, and I can't thank you also enough for uh, that, like I said, the magic weekend out in Denver. I know we didn't put something out, but we definitely, uh, Yet. <laughs> we definitely built something out there. And eventually it will, uh, we're going to sprinkle some of those videos out there. And uh, I know that we're going to work together in life in some form or another. I absolutely know that. Those are... Those are, um, you know, building blocks of a great team later. When you do get somewhere and they go, you got any ideas? You go, well, I kind of want to do it with this guy and this guy and this guy. And, and you carry on that way. So thanks. And uh, I, I, I just love you, man. And I want everybody to go to Bong Load Records is the Instagram. Yep. And you got a Twitter? Uh, I'm not hot on Twitter. There is a Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but yeah. go to the website. But the most active is the website and the Instagram. Yeah, sure. go to the website and get, if you're a vinyl collector, they've put out all this great stuff, reissued it, and uh, the Elliott Smith stuff, the Beck stuff, yeah. the, uh, the um, uh, Killers, and all kinds of great stuff on vinyl. And it's, fa- it's not this bullshit release where the record company just throws something out it sounds amazing it's the quality is incredible the vinyl and uh you're gonna love it so thank you tom rothrock for coming by again buddy look and, forward to the next one Dean. yeah all right see you guys later don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and uh leave a review and the patreon channel patreon dot com slash dean del rey for uh, all the bonus episodes and the youtube channel and look for that bong load records youtube channel coming out real soon keep the candles lit
Hey, hey, with a couple of friends Hey, hey, you wanna 